Good morning, Vision Church. Man, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. It's good to see you all. Man, I'm just excited to worship with you. I've been behind the drums so long that now I'm out here and I get to talk to you and I'm so excited about that. Uh, but uh, one thing that's really exciting uh, is that we're already about to celebrate eight years of Vision Church. And to me, that just blows my mind what God is doing and what he's been doing and his faithfulness to us. And so next week, we'll be celebrating eight years. Technically, I think October 5th was our first <laughs> service we had here on a Monday night. Um, so, but we're going to celebrate October, I believe, is it first next, is next Sunday, October 1st. So we'll be celebrating. Uh, if you noticed, maybe when you came in, you probably didn't because you walked past it. But the wall that we often have the backdrop on where you can either take nice pictures or whatever, there's something nice there. We have some strips of paper there. And it says, uh, this is our story. And so there's some Sharpies with a little stepladder there. We want to encourage you, if you have time after the service, Nikki can talk about this later, but if you want to write just a testimony on there, um, it can be short, it can be long, whatever you want. If you want to just share what God has done in your life, if you want to share a memory from Vision Church, just from your time being here, but answered prayers, whatever it is, we just want to fill that wall with just like, this is this is our story, and it's, our story is all about the, the name of Jesus and the story of Jesus and what he has done in us and through us and so we're really excited about it so when you just have time that'll be up for a few weeks but we'd like to get it filled for next week especially so uh, it's just awesome so let's just pray and let's just thank god for what he's doing god we we love you 
And we're so thankful, God, that you are uh, not only working in us, but you are with us, God, and you are um, growing this, the, the, this family, God, this local church family here, God, that you, God, you just have such a, a, an amazing plan for our church. I know that you do, and, and it's just amazing to see families uh, coming to know you, God, and, and the children growing in the Lord. And so, God, we're just so thankful for that, and we're thankful that we get to celebrate that next week. But God, today we just come here to seek you, God. We come here to worship you, uh, to draw close to you. So right now in this moment, God, whatever is uh, distracting us, whatever is maybe keeping our hearts a little busy right now, our minds a little busy, God, I just pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you'd help quiet our minds, quiet our hearts, that we can see how good you are. And that right in this moment that we would not have hands that are full, trying to juggle so many things in life, but we'd lay those things down, even if it's just for this hour, God, and this hour, hour and a half, God, just to focus on you, to worship you, to receive what you have for us today. So God, we worship you. We're so thankful, God, no matter what we're going through, that you are good. So God, we just want to be thankful for you today, thankful for Jesus, thankful for what you've done for us. So God, we worship you. All of this worship, it is for you. We are not here out of routine. We are here because we want to worship you and you are worthy of it. So all this is for you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. And sin separated. The breach was far too wide. From the far side of the castle, you held me in your side. Cross and great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside, and there at the cross you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time I had hope. the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus. It has washed me white. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life and brought me from the darkness into glory. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sleep, and life has no end. For I have been transformed.
for this day, for your people in this room today. God, that we can lift up the name of Jesus, the sweetest name I know. Our hope, our trust, our victory is in your name and in your name alone, the name above every other name. And God, this service is yours. God, our lives are yours. God, as we um, continue this sermon series together on dangerous prayers, God, I pray that, um, God, when we repeat those prayers and when we try to apply them to our lives, when we say, search me, oh God, break me, oh God, that we mean them. God, even as uncomfortable as it can be, that these things bring us back to the heart of you. God, these things bring us back to the star that you are our foundation, you are our hope, you are the only thing worthy of trusting, the only solid ground, the solid rock we stand on. God, I pray that you open our eyes to the power of your word. God, we have it dusty on our shelves. God, we have Bible apps that haven't been open in months or maybe years. And God, your written word is right there for us to receive. God, we ask you to speak, but we don't get in your word. God, we ask you to move, but God, we do not know you. So God, change our hearts, our church, our community the church, the bride, that we would come back to you, our first love. And so God, we ask that you continue to move, that you continue to change in us, to transform in us, that God, you'd grow this church, not numerically, but spiritually, that God, we feel your presence and we are aware of your presence around us and in us, prompting us to share your word, to share the gospel, to share the truth and the joy that is in our risen Jesus, our risen Lord. God, bring us back to the start, back to our first love, back to you. God, we thank you for our family that we get to do this together. Your church, your bride fall afresh on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church, good morning. Uh, if you would go ahead and grab your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 14. As you can tell, we will be taking Lord's Supper communion towards the end of service. And so uh, if you've been with us, you know we don't take of this lightly. We don't take it out of a religious exercise. We do this in remembrance of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us. And so go ahead and start preparing your heart for that now. And then at the end, we'll have our normal prayer time and we can pray with you. But also we'll use that as a time to prepare our hearts for communion as well. So Mark 14. This is the second week of our Dangerous Prayers series, and I said it like this, uh, we don't necessarily oftentimes think of prayer as being dangerous, but anything powerful can be dangerous, and so we need to understand, and what I mean by that is, the, what, what dangerous prayers are, is I would define it this way, prayers that are effective, but uncomfortable, effective but uncomfortable. I was having a conversation with Caleb Trexler yesterday and we talked about boldness. Like it's really, that's what it means is be, it, these bold prayers, you know, having the audacity to pray bold prayers that are uncomfortable, but we know that they're effective and they're in accordance with God's word and it's what God wants to do. And so that's what we mean by praying dangerous prayers is be, be a little crazy. Pray some crazy prayers. Pray, pray prayers that are going to make you uncomfortable, might make, take you on an uncomfortable journey, but lead you to a better place, lead you to serving God's purposes the way he wants to. 
We said this last week, but I'm just going to reiterate it in case you weren't here. There's two major hurdles in prayer, in your prayer life. There's two major hurdles. The one, first one is simple. It is praying. You say, well, that, that's, it's just easy. You know, you just stop and talk to God. Yeah, it is easy, right? That's what makes it even sadder that most Christians don't even pray once a day. Like, like that's the thing. And so the first major hurdle in, pra- in, your, in growing your prayer life, deepening your prayer life, is starting. It is just setting that time to pray. It's a non-negotiable in your life. This is the time you pray. Put the phone away, turn the TV off, whatever you've got to do. But there's got to be prayer as you're in your life. Not only a specific time to prayer, pray, but also you should be in constant prayer, constant communication with your mind meditating on God at all points. Whether you're at work or you're, you're taking care of the kids, I know that's hard. But you need to be thinking about the Lord in all ways. And you can talk to God even in those moments. If you're a parent, I'm sure you've done that. Lord, help me. <laughs> right? Like, like, God, I need you now. Whether it was a joke, but we should be serious about that. Like, God, I, I need you. I'm losing my patience here. I don't want to be this, you know, uh, grumpy with my children. Help me with this. I don't want to be this short with my spouse. I need your help. Constant prayer and then also specific prayer in your life. That's the first major hurdle is just doing it. The second hurdle is learning to pray the uncomfortable in order to grow spiritually. Learning to pray the uncomfortable in order to grow spiritually. We like to pray safe prayers. There's nothing wrong with safe prayers, but if that's all we pray, I don't know if we're ever going to see God make those huge leaps in our faith and help us grow in the, these huge ways. It's through the uncomfortable, it's through the hard, it's through the, 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 the dangerous, if you want to say, that we see how big God is and how amazing He is. And so we need to stretch ourselves a little bit out of these, Lord, just be with me prayers. That's good, but also, Lord, be with me and use me to minister at work today. Ooh, see, that takes it to another level, right? God's not only with me, but empower me to then be used for you. That's dangerous because sure enough, you pray that you go to work. We're going to get about this in a few weeks, but you go to work and a coworker is going to come up to you and God's going to put the gospel invitation on a tee for you to bring home with somebody. And then you got to make that decision. Am I going to do what I prayed for or I'm going to back down from this? So I want to encourage you, church, pray. Please pray. It is essential for a Christian. Personal prayer is important. But prayer with your spouse is important. And pray with your children. Please set that routine. Pray with your children. Personal prayer. Prayer with someone else. Pray with your spouse and pray with your children. Set these routines now. Set these things now, these these non-negotiables in your life that prayer has to be an essential part of a Christian's life. And once you establish that solid prayer life, then we have to learn to start praying bold and dangerous prayers. Not safe, not comfortable. Last week we, we prayed, search me, O God. Search me, God. Know my heart. Find the sin in there and dig it out and uncover it and reveal it to me. Convict me of that and then lead me to walk in the way you want to. That is a huge, dangerous prayer. Search me, God. Know my heart. I know you know everything. I want you to know everything. Get in there and tell me what is. there's any a grievous way in me. Find my fears. Find my anxieties. Find in my heart where I'm not trusting you and let me know what that is so then I can better trust you in those areas. Search me. Oh, God, I hope that you've started praying this, friends. I hope that this last week you prayed this at least once. I'm hoping you prayed it every day. Search me, oh, God. This week's prayer, I believe, is even more difficult to pray. And it is break me. Break me, God. Now, here's the thing. I know that a lot of us are not going to pray this. I hope you do. But I know that a lot of it, like this, like we're talking, I mean, search me is hard. Break me is on a whole nother level at this point. Break me, God. And here's the thing. This prayer is not consistent with the belief that God will give you everything you want and make your life easy. So that's the reason a lot of us were like, well, I kind of like that, right? Like, God, I I put my trust in God, get the t-shirt, I'm a Christian, and then everything in my life is perfect, right? And there's no problems, I never stress, I never worry, and if you're a Christian, you're laughing because you know from experience that is not what it is. That is not what it is to follow Christ. Now, there are blessings, and God does amazing things, and that's why we pray bold prayers for God to move and deliver and do what He does. 
But to pray, God, break me, take, take me to a, a broken place so that you can be the one that puts me back together the way you want me to be, that is a dangerous prayer. Because we don't know how God's going to do that. We don't know what means he's going to use to do that. He doesn't know if he's going to, if we're going to, it's going to be losing a job. Got to break me so that I can see, you know, it's, a, it's, it's very similar to search me, but once you search and see my sin, break me of these things. Break me of this. Break me down to the point where I'm not holding on to anything else. I can't hold on to anything else so that all, when I look up at rock bottom, when I look up and all I see is you, I can see that you're the one that never left me. And I can grab hold of you. This is a dangerous prayer. And so I want to just put that before you as we cover this. This is one of those prayers that don't, don't pray it if you're just like, it sounds cool, right? Like, you got to mean this if you're going to pray, break me. And then you got to be ready for it and brace for it. God, I want you to do this. I believe if we can learn to pray, break me, that has the potential to change our lives forever. It's going to help us see that a lot of the things in life that we think we need, we didn't really need. We need Jesus, right? It's going to, in ways that we think we've got this handled, right? Like, I can handle this in my life. This sin, it's not a big deal. I can, I can stop anytime. I can handle this anytime. Whatever it is that you think you've got a hold of, when God breaks you, you're going to see that you don't have a hold of that. You need Jesus. So this is a very uh, scripturally consistent prayer that we see in Scripture of people praying. For God to take them deeper by tearing them away from themselves and building them back up the way he wants them to be. So hopefully you're at Mark 14 now. and We're going to read one of my favorite stories in Scripture. I feel like I say that every time we look at the Bible, but just every time I study it, I'm like, I like this one a lot. Uh, It's a very interesting story. There's several times in Scripture where Jesus is anointed by a, a woman. And scholars... Uh, argue on if these are the same case in different cases. Most likely, there, there's, there's two different cases. There's one that happens in a different place. This is a, a different case. Most people believe this is Mary of uh, Bethany. And this is Lazarus' sister. That's what most scholars believe. But for the sake of this, Scripture does not tell us the name of this person in Mark 14. So we're not going to go to tons of assumptions. But just for a little context there, that's what they think is going on. Look at verse 3. It says, and while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at, uh, reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. Now, I want to read that again. I want you to hear these words. She broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Let's pray. Father, God, we come to you now. And I don't know if all of us are ready to pray break me. But God, I pray that you would start working on our hearts through this this message, through this time, that by the end of this service, before we take communion, we can just surrender ourselves to you, that you can do what you want with our lives. So God, we pray, search us. See if there's any sinful way in us. See if there's any pride that needs taken down. And then God, we pray that if it takes brokenness to, to lead us back to you, we pray for that. We pray that you would break us of the things in life that that aren't giving us life and see that you're the only one that gives life. So God, I pray for conviction today. I pray for for all of us, God, that have sinned against you, that have done our own way this past week even, God, that we've chosen ourselves over you. God, help us to see that and by the power of the Spirit, give us strength to turn to you, repent of those things and turn away from those things and trust you. God, I pray as we talk about this dangerous prayer that you would help us understand and give us discernment to understand that the Spirit move in this place. And let us be reminded all the while as we talk about you breaking us, we also know that you are the great physician. You are the one that restores. You are the healer. You are the one that brings the broken pieces back together so we never are left in brokenness, that there's always purpose behind our pain. There's purpose behind brokenness. And God, you are so good. It's so sovereign, so powerful that you can bring about all the broken pieces into something more beautiful. 
So God, we trust you with our lives today. We come to you and we, and we just ask that you would speak to us and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the story, we see a woman who in worship to Jesus breaks a very expensive jar of oil, perfume, uh, alabaster jar, and pours it all for him. And I think this is such a beautiful physical representation of what it looks like to be broken for the Lord. Broken and poured out. I want you to remember those words. We're going to talk about them all the way to the end. Broken and poured out. So we not only are broken before the Lord, but we pour ourselves out before the Lord as an offering to Him. My life is a sacrifice to you, God. I am yours. We're broken to the Lord and we're poured out for him. Our lives, everything we have, God, break us and we want to pour our lives out for you. This is a beautiful physical representation of that. And it is this idea of being fully committed to Jesus. All in. It's the, it's the burn the ships metaphor, right? The missionaries that went across and then when they got to where God told them to go, they burned the ships so they wouldn't be tempted to run back to their old lives because this is where God wants us. We want to, don't want to leave ourselves any way out. This woman comes before Jesus and she doesn't just pour a little bit out and save the rest for herself. She breaks it so that she can't save any of it and gives it all to God. This is what our lives should look like before the Lord. God, I am broken and poured out for you. I am all in. Now, now here's the thing. This is hard for us to get because we are pulled so many different directions. And so in our modern world especially, to, to, to be all in with Jesus, it is, it is really hard. And I don't think any of us, we, we want to say that, yeah, we're all in, but I don't think any of us are all in. I think all of us, we're, 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 hopefully we're like 95% in. I think that's pretty awesome if we are, but we need to be all in. But we're like, well, there's that 5% that still is clinging to these things or belongs in this part of the world or has whatever else. We have to be 100% all in with Jesus. But in order to be fully devoted to Christ, we cannot be clinging to anything else. And so that's the reason I say we must be broken loose of the things that we are clinging to in order to cling to Jesus. This is a prayer for the Lord to break you. It, it means to ask God to do whatever he needs. Whatever he needs to do in order for you to be in his will. So, so here's the idea. There's two roads. There's God's way and, all, and your way, sin, whatever it is. And you're saying, okay, God, I'm on my path and I need to be on your path. So I need you to throw whatever roadblocks, whatever, uh, make the ro road hard, make whatever it is to get me back in your will because your will is better. It is a straight and narrow path. I'm on this crazy path, but I'm having trouble getting off it myself. So God, I need you to break me loose of the path I'm on. Break me down to where I can get back onto your path. I want to be in your will. I could say it this way, God, strip away anything that I'm clinging to more than you. Strip away anything in my life that is distracting me from you. Strip away anything in my life that is keeping me from the purposes you have for me and your will in my life. Strip it away. Break me of these things. In fact, in Psalm 51, it's a beautiful psalm, verse 17 is the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. That seems odd. Does that not seem odd? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. So a lot of us were like, man, I, I, I tithe and I give some of my time to the Lord and I serve and I do these things. But truly, God says the sacrifice he wants is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart that is broken over our sin, broken over our flesh, broken for our world, broken for the lost in our world that comes to Jesus broken like this woman, broken and poured out and saying, God, I'm yours. God says, that's a sacrifice I will not despise. That is a beautiful offering to the Lord. People always say, well, what, is, what does God want from me? He doesn't, really, he doesn't need anything from you. And that's why he doesn't want anything from you. He, he commands us to tithe and serve and do these things for us. Because it's, what, it's good for our souls. It's what we were created to do. And it's by his love that he draws us into his plan. But God doesn't need anything from you. But he desires above all else your soul. 
He desires you to come humbly to Him and see that He is all that you need. So, so talking about being broken, God, break me. Well, usually the first step in being broken for the Lord is being broken of our sin. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. Being broken of our sin. We, we talked about this a little last week, and I have a feeling anytime we're talking about praying uncomfortable prayers and dangerous prayers, sin's going to come up a lot because it's that area that we don't want to talk about. But Scripture talks about it. So we have to be broken of our sin. It's very important. One of the greatest problems, I believe, in the modern church is that we aren't grieved over our sin like we should be. That we tolerate sin more than we should. And I'm talking about, let's not be pointing fingers, ourselves. Right? It's not that bad. It's not that big of a deal. It's fine. It's acceptable. You know, I know the Bible says that, but, you know, God is loving. And we try to just... Oh, man, we just try to, like, water it down. And we say, well, it's not that big of a deal. Listen, sin is a big deal. If it costs the blood of the Son of God, Jesus, a sacrifice, his death on the cross to pay for it, it's a big deal. It's one of the greatest problems in the modern church is that we are not grieved over our sin like we should be. We accept our sin. We make excuses for our sin. All the while, it kills us. Sin is a cancer in our lives, and even the small things tend to spread and grow and lead to other sin. Church, we should be broken over our sin. Not only will your sin break you, but we, our hearts should break in the fact that we are disobeying our Heavenly Father that loves us so much, and we don't obey, and we don't cower, and we, don't, we aren't broken over our sin because we're scared of the punishment that He's going to give to us. We're broken over our sin because we love Jesus, we love God, and we don't want to do anything that's against His character. We want to be in His will. We want to, we want to know Him more. And sin help, uh, gets in between our relationship with God. And so anything that's in there, we should be broken over. I don't want anything. Just like my marriage, right? Like I should be broken over anything in my marriage that's going to keep me from growing closer to my spouse. It should break me because I, I cherish this relationship. Well, even more, we should cherish our relationship with God and not tolerate anything. Anything that would get between our relationship with God. We need to be broken of our sin. Not only should we be broken over it, but we should be broken of it. If God, break me. It might be saying, God, break me loose of, what, uh, of these sins. That I can't do it on my own. I, I, just, I just run back to it, and I just can't help it. And, I, and, and God, I'm, I'm just such, such a sinner, and I need you to break me loose of these things. See, there's a difference in feeling bad that you got caught or called out or feeling conviction because it's against the character of God. I think a lot of us, and this is the main reason we don't like talking about sin, is because we don't like the fact that we get caught or it, cha- it make changes the way people see us. Which the most important thing that we should be grieved over or sin over is because it's against the character of God, that God sees it, that God does not approve of that. This makes me think of the story of Jonah, and we don't have time to go through the whole story. That's a whole other sermon, but the story of Jonah, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but if not, I'll highlight it. Jonah was called to go preach, and he was disobedient to God. He did not want to go where God called him to go, and so he hops on a boat trying to escape God's plan for his life and God's calling and his commandment over his life, and then a storm comes, and he realizes it's his fault, so he gets thrown into the, into the sea, and then a big old fish comes up and swallows him. It says he's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. We're talking about the most awful thing you can probably go through. I mean, I don't want to say that because there's some pretty awful things you can go through, but imagine it is. Like, if you're claustrophobic, this is not the place for you. It is wet. It is nasty. It is stinky. It is dark. It's hard to breathe. It is awful. You want to talk about being broken. I think Jonah was broken. Jonah had to be broken. Look at this. Jonah is caught in a storm, thrown overboard, eaten by a fish, and drugged to the bottom of the sea. That was what God did in Jonah's life to break him. Break him away from his sin and away from his disobedience. And we could look at it and say, man, God is really mean. Or we could see this, that this is a loving father, that it is in God's infinite love that he leads Jonah to brokenness. Because the path Jonah was on was going to lead to his own destruction. 
God had something better for him. And yeah, it took a path to get there. And it doesn't mean it's easy. It might be uncomfortable. But in God's love, he leads Jonah to brokenness. If we look in Jonah 2, um, we're not going to throw this on the screen because it's a lot of scripture. But Jonah 2, verses 1 through 10, this is Jonah's prayer. It says, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, from brokenness. He says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows, they passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought upon, up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. Come on, church. When my life was fainting away in brokenness, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This is what the faith that was stirred in Jonah in the belly of a fish at the bottom of the sea in utter brokenness. He calls us, but God, you're with me and my sacrifice, my life to you. Man, that... that once again, you look at Jonah's life and you're like, I don't want to go through that. I don't want to go through that. I don't. I don't want to be on a, in a storm in, on, a, in a, on a boat. I don't want to be thrown into the sea. I don't want to be almost drowning. I don't want to be eaten by a fish. I don't want to be in any of that. But the place that God took Jonah from that brokenness is pretty amazing. To see the faith he had went from being a coward running from, from the Lord to God using the situation, he says, God, you brought this upon me and I thank you for it with thanksgiving. I sacrificed my life for you. So I don't know about y'all, I don't want to go through that. But I will say I'm willing, I'm willing to go through brokenness if it's what God needs to do to break me of my sin, to make me look more like Jesus, to get me on his path for my life. I'm like, God, do what you got to do. The second part of this is we need to be broken of indifference. Broken of indifference. If you're taking notes, write that down. Broken of indifference. Because here's the thing. It is very easy for us to grow indifferent to church or to the problems of this world or to the people hurting around us. We become jaded. We've been burnt, right? Like You, you know this. Eight years doing ministry as a church, and I start to understand some of these mature churches around that have been around for a while, some of the things they've been through, some of, some of the problems they've had, some of the struggles they've went through, I start to get it. Because you get burnt out. Ministry burns you out. Ministry, you get hurt. You become jaded towards the, the, the problems of this world. And so when this happens, we must be broken loose of that. We say, God, break me of indifference. The fact that I just don't care. I just don't care about people in my community that are hurting. I just don't care about my family. I just don't care really about church. I just go, go do it, go there sometimes. Like, we have to be broken of indifference. And see, here's the thing. It is often in our brokenness that we connect with others. Is it not? Once again, I'm going to quote Craig Rochelle. He says, you might impress people, right, with, with the good things you do, with, with, with what your victories, right? You might impress people with that, but you connect with people and your brokenness. When you can sit down across the table from somebody that's lost a loved one and you can relate to them, you can say, listen, I know a lot of people don't get this, but, but I understand. And you can create a bond that you didn't think that you'd have. When you can go through something with people, when a community goes through something together, through a disaster, through a struggle, you see it's in brokenness that we connect. It's this brokenness that often, often breaks us out of indifference, right? I mean, you always, people always talk about this, especially since we just, uh, it was just September 11th, but you think back to September 11th, 2001, and people were pretty indifferent to church, they're pretty indifferent to each other, 
Like New York's kind of known for that, that they just kind of like, they're all kind of like on their own, they're kind of rude and they just go past each other. But the, but the, the weeks after the disaster happened, the terrorist attack happened, you saw our country uniting and broken as you saw people holding each other up that they didn't even know their name. You saw people volunteering, so it's often out of brokenness that it's what breaks us of indifference. And here's the thing, we should never lose our wonder and awe for God. So if you've grown indifference, indifferent to the awe and wonder of God, then that's a problem. You need to be broken loose of that. If you can ever just kind of casually feel like, man, God, God's cool, you know, like, like you're missing it. Like he's beyond that. You can't just casually be like, God, you know, he, he did some cool stuff. Like, no, he is amazing. Like he is the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, the creator of all things that sent his son to die for my sins. We have to be excited about this. We cannot lose our wonder and awe for God. If we look back to the, where we started in Mark 14, this woman pours out expensive oil for Jesus. It says it's 300 denarii is how much this would cost. So if you want to put this in perspective with inflation, this is a year's worth of wages. A year's worth of wages. So I want you to think about what you make in a year. Might be a lot, might, might not be a lot. That is what this, this, this oil cost to this woman. Her whole, a whole year's worth of wages. And the people respond in verse 4, it says, why was this ointment wasted? Right? Look at that language. Like, that is indifferent language. That's just not thinking it through. Like, man, look how beautiful this is. This woman has clearly experienced the love and forgiveness of Jesus in her life. And she's sacrificing all that she has. For that, that, that would be the right way to respond to that situation. But instead, Jesus' own disciples, if we compare this with another account, it was Judas was thrown in there, which kind of makes sense. If you know his story, he liked his money. But he's like, why is this being wasted? Like, you know what? Just pour a little for him. Just give him a little, but then we can sell the rest and we can do so much good with it. Now, here's the thing. I look at these, these men as I read this and I'm like, shame on them. Shame on them for thinking that. But here's the thing. If I was there, I probably would have agreed with them. Right? Let's put this in perspective. Somebody comes in here today and they say, I've got $25,000 that God told me to bring here and burn for the Lord to sacrifice to him. I'd be saying, hold, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Like, you sure it's meant to like burn it or just to give it to the church so we can do a lot more cool things and help people and do that? No, no, God told me, God told me that I'm supposed to just rip it up, tear it up and, and just, to, just to not cling to it anymore and to sacrifice it to him. I'd be saying, I don't think that's what God wants you to do, <laughs> right? Like, so let's put ourselves in their shoes. They're like, what is she doing? She broke the jar. Do you think it's like, can we still scoop some of that up? Like, can we still salvage some of it? And, and, so I understand, but it's that indifference that leads us to that. Then when we see somebody worshiping and, and giving their life to Jesus, sacrificing, you probably have people in your life that have maybe th given up big opportunities because they felt like God was calling them to, and you're like, I don't know if I'd do that. Like they had a great job, or they quit a job that was really good to take something less because they felt like they prayed about it, and that's what God let them do. You say, oh, I don't know if I'd do that, right? Because we've grown indifference. We need to know that a little in, the, in God's plan is a lot. Yes. And a lot not in God's will is not very much. And so we look at this and this indifference of the Jesus' disciples to not really see this act of worship, but to come across being like, man, she is wasting that. Listen, nothing, no sacrifice to God is ever wasted because he is worthy of it all. Everything we have, our lives, the disciples had seen God do miracles, and it still seems that they had grown indifferent to the worship of Jesus. It became a casual thing to them. What you got to think about it, they're with him all the time. They see him do cool things, but they're just with him, and it becomes you become indifferent to that, right? We cannot be this way. Any offering to Jesus is never a waste. He is worthy of it all. All devotion, all of our time, all of our money, all of our energy, all of our worship, every bit of our lives, He is worthy of it all. It's never, it is never wasted. Broken and poured out, every bit of it. It's His. The third thing is this, if you're taking notes, is broken of ourselves. 
We pray, God, break me. Break me of myself. We need to be broken of ourselves. This might be the hardest of them all because it is often the root to the other problems in our life. So the root to our sin often is the fact that we worship ourselves. Right? Like if we look back at that prayer of Jonah, he's like, these people waste their time worshiping idols. He's like, but I know the one true God. That should be us. But the greatest idol in our life is usually us. So it's, it's ourselves, the, the, the worshiping ourselves and serving ourselves that is often what leads to the other messed up areas of our life, the sin in our life. I think about the story of the rich young ruler in Scripture. You guys might be familiar with this story as well. He comes to Jesus and he asks how to have eternal life. Right? Do you remember the story? He says, oh, oh, you know, Jesus, how do I have eternal life? And Jesus, well, you know the commandments, right? You know, he's like, son, you know the commandments. And this is what he says. Look at Mark 10, 20 through 22. He says, <clears throat> and he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. I've kept the commandments. And Jesus is looking at him. And I love in scripture when Jesus is talking to somebody and they specify, looked at them, looked at him. Jesus looks at him, loved him. Get that? Looking at him, loving him, and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And he says, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. We need to be broken of ourselves. If we look at this situation, this wasn't about the money. This wasn't about the possessions necessarily. See, Jesus didn't say, hey, go sell all your stuff and give me, bless my ministry. Like, like Jesus wasn't trying to get something from him. But he realized that it's not about the money and the possessions. It's about the man's heart. And it's the fact that the man's heart belonged more to his stuff and himself than it did to Jesus. So he tells Jesus, I've done everything the commandments say. Since I was a little boy, since from my youth, I have kept the commandments so what else? What am I missing? I feel like I'm missing something. And Jesus says, you lack one thing. And he doesn't really tell him what the one thing he lacks is. He just puts it this way. You need to get rid of all that stuff that you're clinging to more than me. He says, and after you do it, come follow me. Looked at him, loved him, told him what he needed to do, and said, come follow me. He couldn't be fully devoted to Jesus because his hands were too full. Did you get that? We kind of talked about this last week. His heart was too full of other things. His mind was occupied by too many other things. How can you be fully 100% all in with Jesus if still a lot of you belongs to other things in your life, belongs to yourself? So, so we contrast this story. The man's like, hey, I want, I want to get, do this. And Jesus is like, well, sell all your stuff, follow me. And he's like, I can't do that. And he walks away disheartened. But contrast that by the story that we're reading in Mark 14. This woman who breaks her jar of oil and anoints Jesus is pouring her life out for him. This is her life savings. If this is, she has this really expensive perfume. It's a year's worth of wages. You know what? If she gets in a tough spot in her life, she could sell that to provide for herself and her family. Right? Like, or, or if something happens, she could use this. This was her life saving. This was her bank. This was her savings account. This was everything she had. Her security. Her future. And what does she do? She breaks it and pours it out. She didn't just give a little. She didn't just give half of it. She didn't keep some back just in case, you know, for, you know, rainy day fund kind of thing. She broke it all and poured it all for him. And that, that expression of worship, it is all yours, Jesus. It's all yours. I'm all yours. I am broken. I'm poured out. As she's breaking that, I imagine that is symbolic of her, the way she feels. I'm broken and poured out for the Lord. In Matthew 6, we don't have the scripture, but you can write it down if you want. Jesus is preaching and he says, listen, you cannot serve two masters. You can't. You'll either love one or hate the other or love one or hate the other. Like you just can't. You'll love one and hate. You cannot serve two masters. You can't be split. And in fact, when you read on from that in Matthew 6, what Jesus says there, he goes on to say, you cannot serve God and money. 
So he compares it. We can apply this to a lot of things in life, but he compares it to money because that's where most of us go to. That's what most of us worry about and cling to and work for and live for. He says, listen, you cannot serve both. We have to be broken of ourselves, our wants, our desires, our, what we think we, we think's best for our lives. We've got to be broken of that and realize God knows better. God is a better God than we are. We are horrible gods. We have to trust the one that is a perfect God. I always think about this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He said this, he says, When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That's like not a fun quote that you'd probably put on a pretty painting and hang in your house, right? But, like, but, but think about it. When Christ calls a man, he doesn't say, hey, come, you're awesome. I love who you are, so just come. Fall. Like he says, no, you're, you're not. You're a sinner. You're clinging to things. You've you got problems in your life, but guess what? I'm the one that mends those things. I'm the one that fixes those things. I can give you a new heart, a new life. So he calls us to come and die. I, you know, I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We have to die to ourselves. The call of the gospel, the call to Jesus is an invitation to come and die to yourself and live in Christ. And our fourth and last point is this, broken to be restored. We pray, God, break me. He doesn't leave us in the brokenness. We say, God, break me and restore me. Restore me. Build me back the way you want me to. Put the pieces together the way they should be, not the way I think they should be. We're broken to be restored. Now, now for me, I don't know if you guys relate, but the thought of something being broken is a negative thing to me, which I think makes sense. If, I, if you break something, when you're a kid, if you break something, you get in trouble. If you were playing with something you shouldn't have played with, if you threw a ball and it hit you know, grandma's vase and it breaks, like that's not a good thing. It's a negative thing. We don't want to break things. Because our minds think if something is broken, it's useless. It needs to be trashed. Church, listen to me. This is not the case with God. God is not scared by broken things. This is not how it is with him. He restores the broken into something better and more beautiful than how it started. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful that the way I was raised, I was raised with a dad who could fix anything. I'm still convinced of that. I can, he can fix anything. And because of this, I have trouble getting rid of things. Even when they're broken, my mind says, There's, I've seen my dad use broken things and use it to fix other things. I've seen him restore. I've seen him use things. And so in my mind, I have trouble trashing things and getting rid of things. And I've learned that sometimes you just got to do it. But for a lot of times, like, like our ice, ice maker went out in our fridge and I replaced it with a new ice maker in our fridge. And the old one, which is broken, it was not working. It's sitting in my garage because I'm thinking maybe I can use a piece off that if the new one ever goes out. You know, I'm trying to think about how I can use that to make something new. Man, because I, I have seen broken things be restored and put to good use. And I think it's the way we got to look at our God. Oh, Heavenly Father is like, God, I know that there's these pieces of my life that are broken, that seem useless. The pain that I've went through, the, the struggles I've went through, the things that people have done to me seem like broken and pointless and useless things. But tell me, I'm telling you, church, in the hands of God, they are not pointless and they are not useless. That God will take those broken pieces and make something beautiful out of them. You might be familiar with this. this. There's a Japanese art where they repair broken pottery and things, uh, other things with gold. And in fact, a lot of times the things that are restored almost always are more valuable after they're put back together than what they were before. And you'll see this in Japanese culture and Asian culture. You'll see things, pots and, 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 and pottery put back together with gold in the cracks. And it makes it more beautiful and more valuable. It's called kintsugi is what it's called. And it translated, it literally means join with gold. Broken pieces, they don't work together, but a, a good craftsman, a good artist can come together and bring something precious, gold, and use the gold and the metal to seal it back up and to make it something more beautiful and more valuable in the end. I love that because that's what God wants to do with us. You might be in a place of brokenness because of your own choices. You might be in a place of brokenness because that's where God wants you to be, but you trust that you're good, there's a good God that loves you that wants to come. If you surrender your life to Him, pour your life out for Him, He brings those broken pieces and he brings them together and he seals them back together with him something precious something gold something valuable to where when you're done and it is a process 
Sometimes most of us, we're not done until our life is over, right? Like until we're fully restored. But throughout our life, God uses sanctification and struggles and all of these things and brokenness to bring us into something that is more beautiful than what we ever could imagine. It's something way more valuable than what we started with. You might have been broken by this world, by your own mistakes or other people, but God will use your brokenness and bind you back together with himself. That is beautiful. And here's the part that that's really stro- is a struggle for us to understand. In other cases, it is God's love that does the breaking. A loving father disciplines his children. A loving heavenly father will not let you just keep running in the wrong direction. He will break you. He will not let you keep having this heart of stone and this worship of yourself. God loves you too much to leave you like that. So he will break you. He will throw things in your path. He will, he, he will get you to trip and fall down. It's, honestly, it's like the message of the good shepherd that has a sheep that keeps wandering off. And he finally goes and he just breaks its legs and holds it over his shoulders to take it back to teach him. Like, you can't keep running away from me and then mend it back together so the sheep knows how good the shepherd is. And to us, we're like, that doesn't make sense. That's not good. No, that is good. That is loving. God doesn't break you in anger because you disobeyed. He's not an abusive dad that sees you doing something that annoys him and he comes over and hits you. That is not who God is. He doesn't discipline in anger. He doesn't break you recklessly, but he breaks you like a skilled surgeon that has to wound you intentionally to get the cancer out. He wounds you intentionally and carefully and breaks you carefully the way he can so that he can bring the pieces back together and restore you. So let me close with this. We looked at this story in Mark 14, this woman breaking her jar and pouring her life out for God. But if we look at this exact same chapter, Mark 14, I have to turn a page. You might not have to do that. In this exact same chapter, we skip down to verse 22. This is where Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And I love this. Because when we look in, in context, the way the Bible was put together. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, he, say it with me, broke it. And gave it to them. And he said, take, this is my body. And then he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is what? Poured out for many. Do you see how good God is? So God talks about he wants you broken. A broken contrite spirit is what is a good sacrifice, a good offering to him. That he wants to break us so then he can bring us back together. And, then, and your life might be broken and you think it's beyond many. And God's like, I'm not scared of that. I could fix that. I'm the greatest artist there ever was. Have you seen the universe? I did that. Like, let me handle this. But then we skip down and Jesus is meeting with his disciples. One of who is he knows is going to betray him. In this moment, he looks at me and says, listen, my body, this, this bread represents my body, and he tears it and he says, and it represents it being broken for you. And, the, and this wine that we're drinking, it is a representation of my love and my blood being poured out for you. This is Jesus looking to his disciples and to us now and through scripture and saying, listen, I'm all in for you. So he's not calling us like, I want everybody all in for me. Like he, he, he does call us to be all in with him because it's what's best for us. But he turns around and he says, but listen, because I went all in for you. I was broken for you. My blood was poured out for you. And so Jesus calls us. He's not calling us to do something that he hasn't done. He says, I've been there. I've been broken. I've been betrayed. I've been beaten. I've been persecuted. I've been accused. I've been whipped. I've been nailed to a cross. I've been laughed at. I've been spit on. I've been stabbed. Like, like I know what it is to be broken for a greater purpose. And I did that for you. I'm all in for you. And so when we look at the Lord's Supper, when we look at communion, we come together. I said this earlier. This is not something we just do because it's a religious exercise that churches are supposed to do. We do this because scripture, he says, do this in remembrance of me. And so we do this and we meditate and we think about the Lord and we say, man, God, you are good. And we thank that you were broken 
for us that you were poured out for us that you went all in for us you didn't withhold anything it wasn't like Jesus was like I'll give him a little bit of my life you know he gave it all for us broken and poured some of the beautiful, most beautiful words that we see in scripture so church maybe you feel broken it doesn't really matter at this point why if it's your own doing or if it's God that's working in your life, that doesn't necessarily matter, but you're here and, you, and you're in that place. And I want to tell you, listen, encourage you, it's in the places of brokenness that we can have the most hope. Right? Like, like ever heard anybody say, well, all, the only direction's up now. Like, the only way we can go is up now. Like, we're already hit bottom, so it, can only, it can't get any worse, right? Like, so if you're at the most broken place you feel like you've been ever or in a long time, we can look up as we're in this deep pit we've hit rock bottom and we can see God that he was watching the whole time and his hand was over us the whole time and he works in us and he loves us he sent Jesus to be broken and poured out for us and so here's the thing you feel broken let him restore you you got to surrender to it you can't try to fix yourself and try to put the pieces back together it, it, it you'll just crumble surrender to God let him put the pieces back together let him put himself the gold in there to bring it and make you more valuable and more beautiful than ever before church maybe you just feel stagnant in the faith maybe you feel indifferent to the world and you've just grown uh, jaded towards the things of God listen let him break you pray for it God, break me loose in my sin. Break me loose in my indifference. If, I just, if I'm not caring about the things that you care about, that's not good. Break me of that. And then come and repent. Repent of whatever the sin is in your life. Repent of all of those things and surrender and give it to God. And this is where we can come like this woman. You might not have a physical jar. You probably don't. But we don't need a physical jar of uh, alabaster to come. We can come right now with our lives and say, God, I am your vessel and I am broken and pouring out myself all that I am, all that I think I need to be, the, the, the perceptions of other people, all that I am, I'm pouring it out here. God, I'll let you pick up the pieces and restore me and then fill me with yourself. So we're gonna enter our time of prayer that we always do, and we're gonna use a little time of prayer. Take this time to repent, get your heart right to take communion. If you need prayer, we'll have prayer people up here to pray with you about anything you have. We'll just do that for a few minutes, and then I'll step back up here and we'll enter our time of communion. I know the service is going a little bit longer today, but I hope that's okay, because um, I think this is important. So let's pray. Father. We love you. And God, we do not come to the table of the Lord's Supper lightly. We come in reverency of you, in reverence of you, God, that, that, that we want to worship you, that we want to see be in awe of you and see how great you are. And God, we don't want to be holding on to anything else as we come to the table. So if we're holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness, if we're holding on to the guilt and shame of our past sin, or maybe we have an unrepentant sin in our lives, God, this would be the moment right here. Give us the faith by the power of the Spirit and the strength to lay those things down so that we can take of the Lord's Supper together with a pure and open heart for you. And God, I pray if there's anyone here that needs prayer, needs, God, that you would just speak to them, that they give them boldness to ask for prayer, step forward for prayer. And God, if there's anyone here that does not know you, that this would be the moment that they would step forward and say, yes, Jesus, I need you. Save me from myself. So God, just let your spirit move as we pray in these next few minutes. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
keep praying if you're still confessing and repenting to God. But as you do that, I'm going to ask our ushers to go ahead and start stepping forward. We're going to pass plates uh, for, for the communion. Um, they are double cupped, which means that the bread is on the bottom cup and the juice is on the top. So there's only just take one cup. And then once you have it, we'll wait for everybody to make sure they get it, and then we will take it together. Uh, If you do not know or you're a visitor uh, at Vision, we serve open communion, which means you do not have to be a member here to take communion. You just have to be a Christian. You have to be a believer in Jesus. So if you are not a professing believer in Jesus or you haven't came to the point to make that decision for yourself, we ask that you would not take. But if you are a believer, we want you to take with us. someone that is serving in nursery or kids today uh, have them come sit up here towards the end of service or after service is over and I'll make sure that they get to take communion as well scripture again from Mark 14. I just want us to get the the mindset of Jesus saying, this is my body broken for you. And he says, and as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take this is my body. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your body that was broken for us and and sacrificed for us. the, the, The beating it took, the nails it took, God. We do not take this lightly and we do this in remembrance of you knowing the sacrifice it took to pay for our sin. And we praise you for this. We thank you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen. You may eat the bread. It says, and he took a cup when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blood, that we know not without, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, that it took this for our sin to be paid for. So God, we do not take our sin lightly, but we praise you, God, that you are so loving that you would send your own son to die for us and so we thank you for the blood and we know that there's power in this blood to cover all sins no matter how awful we think they are we praise you and we pray this in the name of jesus amen you may drink <laughs> all right well that's awesome to get to do that together uh, as always, if you have any questions about communion or anything I preached about, I'd love to talk to you about that or continue praying with you if you want to stay up here after the service is over. But uh, I'm just going to pray one more time and thank God, and then I think Nikki has a few announcements. Father, you are good, and we thank you for everything. God, we thank you for this place, that, this church, this local church that you've given us to come together as a family, to worship you, to talk about hard things, to repent, God. 
and to have a family to lift each other up, God, that sometimes we know you're the one that restores the broken pieces, but you give us to each other to help with that, God. You, you give us encouragement from one another and love from one another, so we thank you for this church family, God. We do not take it for granted, and we thank you that we're celebrating over the next couple of weeks, going to be celebrating um, eight years that you've given us here, God. We are so thankful. We do not want to lose our awe and wonder for who you are. We do not want to grow indifferent to what you're doing here, so God, keep Keep, keep, keep mesmerizing us, God. Keep, keep outdoing yourself with what you're doing because we know you're able. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church. So I have a few announcements before you leave today. Um, some things that I want to make sure you know. Um, first up, we it is already, I can't believe it, but Operation Christmas Child season. Um, so we do this every year, and we invite you to take a box and fill it up with your family to pray over it. And um, there's even some papers out in the lobby that have letters that if you have kids in your family that they can fill out, tell um, the kid, the recipient of this box, where they live and what they do. If you're not familiar with Operation Christmas Child, um, it is an initiative to give um, kids in other countries that otherwise wouldn't be able to have a gift an opportunity to open a box. We fill it with toys, we fill it with um, personal hygiene items, things that kids need, um, and it's just a great way um, for us to fulfill this mission internationally. We do local things, and we do regional things, and then this is one way that we can reach um, the world in a different way. Um, so we invite you, there's a table out by the stairs in the lobby. Um, there's some information there of what ideas of what to pack, what not to pack, all of that good stuff. Um, take a box with you um, and just be sure to bring it back. Is it by November 12th, Tammy? November 5th, so the first Sunday in November. Uh, have those back um, filled up for us. Don't worry about if you see something about the postage, the church covers all of the postage costs. We just ask that you take the box and fill it up, whether an individual or a family or take multiple or whatever you feel called to do. We invite you to do that with us. And that Sunday, we always pray over all of the boxes um, and all of the recipients of those boxes. So we're excited to be doing that. The other thing I want to make sure you know is I can't believe it's already time for this either, but um, most of you that are in this room helped fundraise last year um, for our kids to go to summer camp it feels like it was just last week, um, but this last summer. So it's time to start doing that again. We will have a bake sale at Fall Fest in DuCoin. I believe that's Saturday, October 14th. Um, so we invite you to help um, give us baked goods to make that happen. We had a ton of fun last year at Fall Fest doing that. That's here in town at Kai's Park. Um, so if you're interested in donating um, a pie or donating brownies, there's some information out there in the lobby as well on that little wooden table and pass the offering box um, that has some suggestions or some ways you could do that. There's a sign-up list so we know what to expect. So if you want to bring a dozen cookies, mark your name and your phone number and what you plan to bring um, so that we can kind of fill in the gaps and do that. But this is an easy way and a fun way um, to be able to support our students in going to camp next summer. Um, so please do that. If you're interested in even helping them run the tent, we would take all of the help we can get to make that happen. So again, that's Saturday, October 14th. We need some extra help with that. Um, and the last thing that I want to bring up again is Nathan mentioned at the beginning of the service, and if you go into the lobby on that wall to the left before you exit, um, there's some craft paper hanging, and it says, this is our story. So we invite you, as he said earlier, to write, um, whether you've been a part of Vision for a week or you've been a part of Vision for um, this entire eight years, I can't believe it's been eight years, um, we invite you to write an answered prayer that you've had during that time, um, a story of how you've seen God's faithfulness, a memory of how crazy it's been to have started services out in that lobby, <laughs> um, to come into this place in the way that God has grown us. So we invite you to do that so it can be um, a cool photo op um, next week as we celebrate those eight years. And even more than the photo op, for us to read each other's testimonies. That's part of what we do as Christians is we tell people what Jesus has done in and through us. Um, so we're excited about that. So do that. Be here next week for the celebration as we celebrate eight years. We'll have some snacks and some good stuff, and it'll just be fun. Um, so guys, thank you for being a part of it, and we're excited to see you next week. <laughs>